Core. Hello, we're here with Teresa Mosqueda, who's running for re-election to Seattle City Council, position number eight. Would you like to go ahead with your two minute introduction? Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with you today. Um, it's been an incredible honor to have uh, earned your support four years ago when I ran for Seattle City Council. I'm coming back to run for council again to seek your endorsement to make sure that we continue the good work that we've started. I'm really proud of some of the work that we've done on Seattle City Council, some of the historic investments that we've made in housing and in homelessness, the most biggest and pressing issue facing our city. And with your support, we were able to get Jumpstart Seattle passed, the largest progressive revenue proposal passed in the city of Seattle that will soon bring in over $200 million a year by being a progressive progressive tax, taxing the largest companies and the largest salaries so we can invest in housing and homelessness, equitable development, and green new deal priorities. On council, you know that I came in as a labor advocate, I'm committed to leading on worker priorities, standing up for worker rights and wanting to expand the right for more folks to have access to good union living wage jobs. We did that. Domestic Workers Bill of Rights is a national standard that uh, Congresswoman Jayapal and now Vice President Harris look at as a blueprint for their legislation that they introduced. And we did that with hotel workers uh, protections, protecting folks from harassment and intimidation, um, making sure that they had uh, stable uh, wages and um, more reasonable workloads. And we did that for things like bereavement leave so that people could take leave for the loss of a kiddo or a miscarriage. These are important worker protections. And now what's happened? COVID has ravaged our community, our country, and the most pressing issues that we came in ready to fight for are now even more bare and stark. Income inequality, fighting for affordable housing, making sure that we're creating um, houses and shelter for those who are living outside. All of the issues that I came in ready to fight for, we have more work to do. I'm interested in coming back, earning your support and doing even more progressive good policies with your um, endorsement, I hope, uh, so that we can continue this good work and make it a more equitable community and recovery uh, post-COVID. Great, thank you. And so now we'll move into the prepared questions and I'm gonna post the first one into the chat box. And the question order that I have is Sherry, Summer, Jeff, and then Laura. I'm sorry, uh, Sherry, Summer, Laura, then Barbara. Um, so Sherry, would you like to go ahead? There we go. Um, what specific actions will you take to address the homelessness crisis in Seattle, both in the short term and long term? And please address land use, zoning, revenue, regional collaboration, the role of social services, the role of the police and justice system. <laughs> Wonderful, in two minutes. <laughs> okay, okay, great. Um, Thank you so much for this question. I really appreciate how you have asked about homelessness in the context of how it relates to housing and zoning. The biggest thing that we can do to address the homelessness crisis in Seattle is to create more homes, more permanent supportive housing, more first time home buyer options, more affordable housing so that fewer people get pushed out of our city, pushed into homelessness. We can solve this crisis by building more housing. And the number one thing that's um, preventing us from building additional housing is the fact that still over 75% of our land is zoned for single family use. I am committed to creating residential zoning so we can create more um, apartment complexes, more multifamily structures, more affordable units, more uh, middle income units, more first time home buyer options across the city. And it's not a scary proposal. It's what the fabric of our city looks like. If you go door to door in Capitol Hill or in Queen Anne where I used to live, they have two and three and four doors on some of these very beautiful old homes. We can create multifamily structures, create more affordable housing, we can create more apartments like the one I lived in in Queen Anne that has now been deemed illegal to build. That's just wrong in a city that's growing by um, the amount that we have almost 20% since the beginning of last decade. We have to respond by building more housing. And in the meantime, doing many of the things that your question asked about, making sure that there's more support for um, uh, per, uh, our providers. One of the things that I fought for on council was making sure that providers actually had a cost of living increase. Can you imagine 
10 years, these homeless providers never saw a cost of living increase. Many of them were eligible for the same programs that they were qualifying their clients for. We have to invest in our providers, make sure that these organizations have the support that they need, that the providers are not earning $30,000, which is not an affordable wage in the city of Seattle, and making sure that we're redirecting funding from historically thought of policing and into upstream investments like housing, social services, and health services that can truly stabilize folks and create a more equitable economy and create more housing for all. Great, thank you. Uh, question two, Summer. What is your strategy for creating dense and diverse neighborhoods and assuring affordable housing? How would you work to dismantle systemic racist arrangements such as redlining, including but not limited to exclusionary zoning and land use policies? Do you support and would you sponsor city legislation to end single family zoning? Uh, as Berkeley, California recently did. Should I launch into it? Yes. Okay, yeah. great. Um, thank you so much for this question. And it's not just Berkeley, California, right? It's so many other cities, including my hometown of Olympia, where I grew up. It's being discussed in Tacoma. We can do this here. It doesn't also have to be scary, like I just mentioned. This is a true equalizer. If we can allow for folks to live in our city, this is how we create greater economic stability for working families. It is also an environmental justice policy. We can create affordable housing in our city and create... We can create affordable housing and create more um, tree options. We can push back the, the um, buildings so that there's more um, trees lining the street. We can create green roofs. We can create more park space. We can create more plazas. It is possible to do both. And why is this an environmentally justice policy? Not only marrying development with green canopy, but because if we prevent more folks from getting pushed out of the city, they're not commuting two hours in by bus or by car. It's good for their health of the commuters and the workers. It's good for the health of our local environment. And yes, I am absolutely committed to making sure that our single family zone gets converted into residential zoning. It is absolutely the right thing to do. Environmental justice, social justice, worker justice policy. It is also good for small businesses who told me when I met with folks up here in uh, West Seattle that they want workers to be able to live near their places of employment and childcare. Many of their workers have to spend hours commuting in to come to work and are so worried about whether or not they're gonna get home before their childcare closes. Let's build the housing with childcare on the first and second floor with small seconds. business opportunities on those first and second floors. We can do this. Um, to address issues of displacement specifically for black, indigenous and people of color uh, communities are Latino next communities, we must create housing through the lens of what is um, a racially justice um, uh, driven housing policy. I have put some of those policies into our annual plan, uh, the uh, administration and finance plan, the ANF plan, to require the city to do more affirmative marketing and um, community preference, which means for the folks who used to live there, make sure that they have the first preference to come back to affirmatively market to those who are most directly affected by displacement. So we can do both. We can do this environmentally justice policy that is coupled with housing policy and lead with a racial justice lens. Great, thank you. Uh, question number three, Laura. Would you decrease the Seattle Police Department budget and if so, by approximately what percentage? What is your plan for the city's fog negotiations? Do you support and will you advocate for ending qualified immunity for law enforcement? Thank you so much for this question. Um, so last year in the wake of George Floyd's murder, Breonna Taylor's murder, so many others who have been murdered at the hands of police, it was a call for action. It was a racial reckoning of the moment and it can't just be a racial reckoning without that reckoning. I think it is important that the city of Seattle acted and acted quickly. Obviously not enough was done, but some really important steps were taken to, I believe, start to shrink an overinflated budget and to reinvest into community priorities. Community priorities like mental health services, housing services, childcare, educational programs, youth um, uh, violence reduction strategies, and making sure that we were um, getting more money into the hands of those who are disproportionately impacted by over-policing and excessive policing. 
we did that. Only the city of Austin basically took a larger portion out of their budget. It was Austin, then Seattle, and then I believe um, New York and Los Angeles. We have, um, I think, a lot of folks who are across the country looking at us because we began making some very important steps, but much more needs to be done. We have to recognize that the reason that folks are calling for such divestment is because that budget has increased by almost 47% since um, 2012, and no other department has seen that type of increase. So having the appropriate scale down as we appropriately increase um, funding into the community is the right thing to do. I stand by the work that we did last year, and I, I'm going to continue to work on those commitments that I made. The other thing was SPOG negotiations. This is now seconds. a time for us to look across the country and recognize that the negotiations that we had committed to before, they never got um, basically translated into different types of policing. The strategies that we tried to put into place to get folks to get stopped getting sprayed in the street and um, gas in their own homes, everything that the council tried to do in that effort was stopped. And so we need to use the power of our collective bargaining um, and also recognize that we, me, city council and the mayor's office, we are on the management side. This is our responsibility too, to negotiate in good faith to make sure that we're holding those folks accountable. If I were at the federal level, you would wanna see the same type of um, holding your military force accountable. We need to recognize that we have militarized our local police. We have put them in armed outfits and armed vehicles. Those are dollars and strategies time. that I think have gone in the wrong direction and we um, can hold them accountable at the SPOG negotiation table and in the budget. Great, thank you. And question number four. Uh, oh, and I would uh, pose qualified immunity. I mean, <laughs> okay, I would we... advocate for ending it. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see, Barbara. Let, uh, let me know, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, uh, how, will you prior, how will you prioritize transportation infrastructure for biking, pedestrians, public transit, commercial vehicles, and cars. Which do you view as most important to prioritize funds for? Thank you so much for this question. Um, what I think I've been trying to do on council, especially in the last eight months, as we've been talking about the um, vehicle license fees and the universe of dollars that is gonna be coming to us from the state advocacy that uh, many of you have helped with, thank you so much. And the federal advocacy, we have a lot of money coming in for infrastructure. I am really committed to trying to stop the silo of the various types of infrastructure projects because investments in, in bridges and roads ought to include pedestrian and bike protected lanes. I lived right around the corner from the Ballard Bridge and it is terrifying to bike across that bridge or to walk across that bridge. We can be doing both at the same time and that puts people to work as well. Um, it is a priority, I think for me, to be looking at where we have the highest rates of fatalities and also looking at where we have the highest um, rates of divestment or disinvestment over the years. And that's in our communities of color. We have long time told folks that we have a, a commitment to vision zero, but it seems like zero vision in many cases when funding doesn't come through and people continue to die. So I think as a priority, it is looking at where there is um, higher rates of accidents, and I shouldn't say accidents, higher rates of individuals being hit by cars. Um, and that is a preventable strategy if we actually had protected bike lanes and safe places for people to walk. I think we can also continue to make sure that there's investments in um, our communities of color who have seen um, slower rates of sidewalks being created, slower rates of, of bike lanes connecting folks. And that's what we did in the budget last year. Every single mass coalition priority that was asked for last year, we funded in the budget and when I was budget chair. And we did the same for the transportation choices priorities. I also know being a labor advocate that many folks who are driving freight and, um, and large vehicles around the city, we rely on them for our commerce. And none of those drivers ever want to be in a position where they are causing injury or harm to another body. It is good for those drivers as well if we're creating safe, protected bike lanes and pedestrian areas, because I know many of those drivers and some who have suffered um, from post PTSD because of uh, injuries that have been caused by their vehicles and they don't want that to happen either. So it's, it can be a both and, and a win-win for both um, commerce and pedestrian and bike if we do it right. Thank you. 
So next we'll open it up to uh, questions from the board and uh, we have about six minutes available for that. Um, so if folks have any questions, the responses to these are one minute each. You may raise your hand if you have something. It went by so fast. It does go by fast. <laughs> And I apologize, Alice. I think it was about 15 seconds, 20 seconds over on one or two. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> okay, Sherry, go ahead. And then Summer. I'm curious. I know um, the state legislature just passed um, a bill to allow um, cities or jurisdictions, I think it is, to um, do public broadband. And I'm just curious what that might mean for CL. Well, thank you so much. And thanks to the legislative members from the 36 and all of you for your advocacy as well um, on um, uh, broadband for all. I had my, my shirt on at one of the LD meetings that said upgrade Seattle because we must upgrade Seattle. We must upgrade our infrastructure. And when we talk about racial justice, gender justice, um, you know, uh, security for all, you cannot get a job, go to the doctor, you know, make sure that you're able to keep your family um, healthy, safe, and fed without the internet these days. We all rely on it. And that has all been even proven more true in COVID when we think about um, equitable access to education in a work from home uh, and study from home situation. I, I don't know the technical answer to your question, but I am absolutely committed to broadband for all. And we'll seconds. follow up um, to make sure that if there's any action that the city of Seattle should be taking to have um, our city act with urgency and lead by example to get broadband for all, I am all in. And I know we have great partners at the 36 LD who can help make that possible too. Thank you, uh, Summer. Hi, I'm sorry my phone keeps ringing uh, every time I'm trying to ask a question. One thing I have really appreciated is how well you hone in on solutions um, for how to uh, use progressive funds, new progressive funds to uh, put towards great programs and a lot of your ideas. Can you talk about what else we might need to be doing here in Seattle to be able to raise some of the money for some of the things you've been talking about? Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Oh, excuse me. Thank you very much for um, recognizing that um, Jumpstart Seattle should be a first step, right? That is not the end all be all. I wanna make sure that we continue to fight for more progressive revenue. Very excited about the capital gains um, effort that passed again, thanks to our state legislators, especially in the 36 for their um, leadership on this. And um, if there's anything that we can do at the city to slightly bump that up, I think it makes sense. You know, you look at income inequality and where it's the more, most stark and where we have some of the folks who um, have the ability to pay a little bit more, it's here in the city of Seattle. And we have some of the highest needs as well. So I think trying to identify if there's ways to layer on appropriately um, for certain categories of folks, um, I think that makes sense. And I think it makes sense to do it, um, to, to direct those funds to housing and homelessness services. Two thirds of the funding for Jumpstart is going to housing and homelessness services, but it's still not enough. I think we need over uh, 400,000 um, units, 400, units in our region um, very soon, and we need to build more. So I'm, in, I'm interested in that. Thank you. Uh, further questions? I have one. Uh, we have a um, an environmental committee now in the 36 and they submitted a question. Um, it's how would you use your office to address climate justice, ensuring a healthy environment and access to climate supporting solutions such as multimodal clean transportation options? Can you ask that last part of the question one more time? Sure. Um, and, and access to climate supporting solutions such as multimodal clean transportation options for all residents. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much to the committee for that question. Uh, I think that one of the most important things to recognize is the funding that will be forthcoming from Jumpstart directly to Green New Deal investments is going to be huge. I mean, we're talking about um, over $10 million a year. This is a really exciting opportunity for us to put dollars into policy. Um, there are definitely some things that I think I want to lift up that we've done on environmental justice policies. Number one is the MEETS legislation. It's basically energy efficiency for public buildings. I want to do what New York has done and require energy efficiency in all buildings downtown. 
Um, I want to do more to make sure that we're incentivizing built, building green buildings and green houses. Right now, I understand from some of the um, built green folks that it is actually more cumbersome seconds. to try to build some of the green housing. And so we need to change that. In terms of transit, building housing next to transit, building housing in our city is an environmental justice policy. And it's also a transit policy because the more people that live in our city, the fewer people who need cars. And we need to be making transit free, which requires additional revenue as well. And I think we can get folks on board with a revenue stream for that. Great, thank you. Any further questions? All right. I oh, could Alice? ask a question. Sure, um, what, uh, what do you propose to do about um, the sweeps? And yeah. <laughs> Thank you um, for asking that question. Right now, we are still a year into a global deadly pandemic that the CDC has told us we should not be moving people if we do not have appropriate housing. I continue to tell the mayor's office that it is not only causing additional harm to those individuals, it's actually a counter to our public health strategy to be moving people. What we ought to be doing is creating additional non-congregate shelter space in hotels and tiny houses and in the permanent supportive housing that we need. That is the solution. It is not to move people. That only makes it harder for outreach workers to try to find them when there is housing or health services available. And it is absolutely deadly to do that for individuals who are living outside and for our population as a whole to move people. Um, in a time when the CDC has said not to do it. So I will continue to stand against sweeps. And in doing so, at the same time, we'll continue to fight to make sure that there's more funding for um, the housing and non-congregate shelter that we know that people need in order to get inside. I'm also supporting safe lot funding in the ARPA funds to make sure that RVs have a safe place to go with hygiene services and social services so that um, they're also not moved around and swept around our city. This is the biggest issue facing our city, but the solution is not sweeps. The solution is housing and social services. Thanks. Thank you so much. And that is our time. So if you would like to go ahead and give a one minute wrap up, uh, that would be much appreciated. Uh, again, I want to thank you all very much for um, your support over the years. Uh, we have made some incredible progress together, but I know that there's so much more to do. I would be very honored to have the 36th endorsement. I have Representative Frame. I have Representative um, Barry as endorsers, um, uh, uh, Council Member Cole Wells, uh, and our very own Congresswoman Jaya Paul, along with Bob Ferguson from the AG's office. I will continue to stand with you to fight for progressive policies and not just, you know, speak at the podium, but actually get things done past the policies and bring together these large coalitions to make what seems like a very challenging um, solution actually possible. We can do these things. We can address the crises that are facing our, um, our community. And one of the biggest issues that I wanna to continue to fight on is the great equalizer that child seconds. care can be. Child care right now is going to be the key to helping folks get back into the workplace and creating a more equitable community. I'll be fighting for child care, additional worker protections, more investments in Green New Deal priorities, and making sure that um, we have support for our smallest businesses, especially BIPOC folks across the city. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you.